Today's episode is made possible by Affinity Solutions. Unlock your business's potential with actionable insights into consumer spending, powered by Affinity Solutions. With exclusive insights from over 140 million cards, Affinity Solutions showcases consumer purchase behavior with unprecedented clarity. Seize the opportunity to reshape your strategy with accuracy, execute with precision, and measure with confidence. Affinity Solutions equips you to outperform in today's competitive landscape. Step into the future of analytics with Affinity Solutions today. Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, an e-market podcast made possible by Affinity Solutions. This is the Friday show that insulted its guests right before we hit record. Not a great strategy, but it happens. I'm your now remarkably unpopular host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. Fortnite maker Epic wins against the Google Play Store. McDonald's launches a new restaurant called Cosmics. Global women's sports explodes. In a good way. It's not like it. You get it. The return of the bundle. How to keep up with AI development. And will we live underwater soon? By choice, that is. Not because we ruined the planet. That is inevitable. Join me for this episode. We have three people. Let's meet them. We start with our senior analyst on the retail and e-commerce team based on the south coast of England. It's Karina Perkins. Hi, Marcus. Okay, let's just get this out of the way up front. Karina's upset with me. <laughs> Rightly so. Because I didn't tell her, slash did tell her in an email, which she did chose not to read, that it's a video podcast. So if Karina's kind of sulking throughout the episode and is angry with me, or cross, as the Brits would say, Nice. Which we've decided is, was it politely angry? Is that what we said? Politely angry, yeah. yeah. Then that's why she's been a little meanie. Yeah. Okay, that's But it's on. wonderful to be here. <laughs> Feels like it. This is going to be a terrible... Bill's upset with me already because we never start on time. Ross is always kind of angry, I think, with me. Uh, slash just in general. Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> slash in general. It's going to be a very... Uplifting Hint. episode. Uh, we're also joined by Ross Benish. He is uh, one of our senior analysts on the media and nope, on the digital advertising and media team based above New York City. Hey, Ross. Hey, Marcus. And finally, <laughs> and, <laughs> and finally, we have, we have one of our principal analysts who covers everything UK, a little bit of mainland Europe based on the south coast of England as well. It's Bill Fisher. Hello, Marcus. Can we move this along, please? <laughs> This is going to be a horrible episode. Uh, let's start. We're talking about the story of the week. Uh, Fortnite just won. Uh, sorry, Fortnite maker Epic just won uh, a, a, its uh, lawsuit against uh, Google Play Store. What are the ramifications of that? We move to the game of the week where our folks on the panel will compete for a championship belt. And we end talking about some random trivia in our dinner party data segment. Let's start, though, with the story, the story of the week. <laughs> Fortnite maker Epic wins against the Google Play Store. So, let me explain. The Associated Press uh, was saying that the federal court, uh, a federal court jury, just decided that Google's Android App Store has been protected by anti-competitive barriers that have damaged smartphone consumers and software developers, dealing a blow to a major pillar of the tech empire. Tiny history here. Uh, Kia Kokolacheva of Axios explained that in 2020, Epic updated its Fortnite game on iOS and Android, adding options for players to buy virtual items directly from Epic, bypassing the uh, the phone maker's 30% cut on in-app purchases. Apple and Google kicked Epic off their stores, saying they'd violated their policies. Epic sued both companies, saying their control of the stores on their phone uh, constituted an anti-competitive monopoly, shielding their stores from competition to protect their multi-billion dollar gold mines. In Apple's instance, Apple won the case against Epic um, from uh, it was a 2021 trial decided by a federal judge in a ruling that is under appeal at the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. The Google side, the Google Play Store versus Epic, that was decided by a nine-person jury, and they saw things differently. They said that Epic should win. So that's where we are, folks. Um, reactions. Well, this will make it easier for others to make the case that Google has a monopoly in other areas of their business. There, there are two other... Um court cases right now against Google, um, but the same title, United Google versus the United States. 
one's about ad tech the other one is about the search market so there's setting a precedent now to establish um monopolistic control with google this time Mm -hmm. it's in the play store but there's other aspects that regulators are going to come after yeah yeah could yeah please please jump in no i was going to say obviously the ruling could have ramifications for app developers but it could also have a kind of benefit for consumers because at the moment Google and Apple are requiring companies to use their payment systems and take a cut of the profit. Whereas if companies can charge consumers directly, they might then be able to reduce their prices for those items. Mm-hmm. Yeah, could it have a bad, a bad impact on consumers though? Cause I always think primarily Apple, but Google play as well. They, they like control and there's a part of me that likes that control that they have because I know I'm in a safe environment. And if I've got a bunch of randos just offering me payment through their apps, yeah. is that going to be a problem for consumers? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. It is yeah. definitely easier to buy from Apple or Google. But they make it so seamless when it's centralized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think people do. Like, It's going to be interesting to see what, what I mean, what... Um comes out of this because the presiding judge won't decide what google will have to do next until um january of next year will it have to lower the cut it takes in the app store um will it have to make some other kind of structural changes so we're still going to figure out what is is going to happen exactly um the app store i mean it makes a lot of money 12 billion in operating profit in 2021 for google uh, so that's in profit margins of over 70 percent according to evidence epic presented um at the trial uh, Google CEO Sundar Pichai disputes those numbers, um, but it does make a ton of money. Um, I guess part of me wonders of the impact here because, yeah, I mean, Bill, it could be they could make less money. Sure, they could say, okay, you, you're not allowed to charge thirty percent, fifteen percent, whatever it is, um, and, and take that off the top when um, app developers are, are putting their apps in the app store. But I do what? Yeah, you make a good point. I do wonder if if it's kind of like google search if you know they do end up ruling that google you know in the separate trial on search has been paying apple this money to make sure that it is the primary search engine on search engine on its devices and so you shouldn't do that and therefore you're letting people decide what search engine they want it's not the pre-installed one but everyone just goes with google because that's what they've got i mean that's what happened in europe correct Mm -hmm. they ruled they ruled that um, you can't have uh, Google be the default search engine, but everyone was so used to using it. It was kind of an entrenched behavior, and so nothing ended up changing. I mean, what do we actually think is going to change here? I don't know, but one thing that I found when I was looking into this, and I'm not um, well-versed in this uh, country, so in South Korea, though, in 2021... The government there enacted a new law that allows app developers to use third-party payment options for in-app purchases, Um, and and, and it banned app store operators from forcing them to use their their own systems. Mm -hmm. So this is already the case in South Korea, and Mm -hmm. Apple and Google agreed to that as well. Um, I'm I don't really know how that's playing out, but there's there's a precedent here, and I haven't heard that things have blown up over there uh, in a bad way um so potentially this this may play out in in, a, in the wider context globally mm-hmm. and there'll probably be an appeal too this doesn't necessarily mean this is the final uh determination epic had filed a similar suit against apple um not too long ago and, and lost that case so um you know, it's tough to tell if it's just because of one jury that the outcome was different here, or if if they're just the bigger sentiment swinging against these large tech companies. Did, yeah. did you did you see what what's the name of the CEO? Is it Tim Sweeney, the Epic Games CEO? Yes, I yeah. believe so. Um, so what, one of the reasons why he gave that the 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 Google lawsuit was successful and the Apple one wasn't was that Google writes stuff down and Apple hadn't that there was no paper trail. So <laughs> they were able to prove in court that Apple had behaved nefariously because there was a there was a paper trail. Google, um, you mean? Uh, sorry, Apple. Google, not yeah. Apple. Google, exactly. And Apple didn't do that, so they couldn't nail them to the wall for a reason. Is that why you're always paying cash, Bill? 
Exactly. You sneak. <laughs> That's why Slack messages disappear so quickly. <laughs> don't want you to um, see what you're saying. <laughs> but Ross is, um, you know what? Don't doesn't disappear though, um, Karina. Subject lines of your email, you know. So if someone, if a, if a podcast host wrote video podcast, you'd you'd always be able to refer back to it. You know. Mm, were, you, were you waiting all episode to bring that back, Marcus? <laughs> Maybe. Um, but no, Ross makes a good point, though. Um, Google is going to, they said they're going to appeal the decision. Paul Swanson, an antitrust lawyer at Holland and Hart, was saying such a clear verdict is going to make it uh, much harder, though, for Google to beat it back in post-trial briefing and on appeal. Um, the district court process will likely wrap up in a few months, but um, Google's appeal could take between 12 to 18 months. So sometimes I feel like we shouldn't call these appeals. We should just call them like a stalling tactic because... Maybe it gets overturned, uh, appeals can get overturned, but even if it doesn't, Google's going to benefit from being able to not even kick this can down the road, but punt it a year, year and a half into the future, um, where they're still going to be making tons of money off of this uh, practice. Um, and and then maybe they do end up having this overturned at the end of it. We'll see. Um, one part of this I thought was interesting, I wanted to quickly bring up, I was speaking to Jeremy, Jeremy Goldman, who writes for our, one of our... Um, Sorry, who's our senior director of briefings in the, in the kitchen? So I'm in the studio in New York today, and um, he was making the point that there's all these these uh, sweetheart deals, and that was a big part of this case. Is that um, in the trial, Epic noted that Google let Spotify use its own payment system uh, without giving Google a cut of the revenue. Google says that Spotify's unprecedented popularity um, warrants special um, agreement, the special agreement. And so that was a big part of this case as well. It was, it's not that everybody is in the same boat. It's that it's giving favorable treatment to certain folks. And um, that, I think, could have also tipped the scales. No, Google gets favorable treatment on the other side, though, like with Roku and Fire TV. Uh, they don't they aren't allowed to sell any YouTube ad inventory. And there was a standoff between Roku and, and YouTube, um, I think probably about 18 months ago. But YouTube is so essential that they, they get what they want while other apps have to give a portion of their inventory. So once you become essential, um, whether you're um, whatever side you are on the transaction, you, you can demand more leverage than you would otherwise. And Google's been on both sides of that. Yeah, that's a great point, mate. Um, all right, folks, that's all we've got time for, for the story of the week. Let's move swiftly to the game of the week. Today's game, what's the point? With a twist. It's not really a twist, it's the same. I read out four stories and our contestants give us the main takeaway of the story. Uh, okay answers get one point, good answers get two, and answers that give you the same feeling as crushing your enemies. Too dark? I felt like it fit with the theme of the mood today. Okay. You all look like evil villains. I'm glad it's a video podcast. Uh, answers leave you with that feeling. They'll get you three points. Uh, you get 20 seconds to answer before you hear the bell. Most points wins. Gets the last word. V, when you when I'm introducing the guest today, could you put some like some like Disney bad guy music? <laughs> Let's get that thrown on the top. Uh, very fitting. We start with round one, of course. That's where the numbers begin. Ross, you're first. McDonald's launches a new restaurant called. Cosmics. So Cosmics is it's named after an orange alien mascot featured in past McDonald's ads. Uh, and the new chain will focus on serving to-go drinks in hopes of snagging a slice of the iced beverage sales that have helped power record sales for Starbucks recently, notes the Wall Street Journal's uh, Heather Haddon. Uh, the first location opens in a Chicago suburb in December. Um, and it's going to have four drive through lanes, no dining room. It's a smaller uh, smaller format. Uh, no fries or burgers. Cosmics will offer its own menu centered around customizable ice drinks, but it's not just beverages. Um, so the question, Ross, for you is, uh, will this new brand be a success for McDonald's? This is going to be kind of like Crystal Pepsi for McDonald's, <laughs> something that's going to be around for a few years. They're trying out something new, but it's going to go away pretty quickly. Okay. Um Karina. Yeah, I think it depends how McDonald's is measuring success because I think it's stressed not to get too excited because it's only going to open about 10 stores in Texas. So yeah. I imagine it will probably succeed on that front. Yeah. The first brand has had huge queues. Apparently people are queuing for hours and bribing people to shorten their weight. There's been loads <laughs> of uh, hype on TikTok. 
and Gen Z love customizable cold drinks, don't they? So I think it will see success. I reckon ten stores. Yeah, why not? Bill. Yeah, not got a clue. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, where does it oh, fit good. in the McDonald's universe? The 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 I'm minded of McCafe um, brand. Ah, uh, yes, we saw quite a lot of success. I, I found out it's the third largest coffee brand in France. Did you know? Mm. Um, which I find quite remarkable. Um, but you know, oh. is it a good idea? As you mentioned, it's it's going to have a very small footprint, so smaller sunk costs. It's it's worth a try, I guess. Will it be successful? Don't know. Yeah, it's odd that it's centered around an obscure character that they created in in the late eighties. There, there's yeah, great that's retro, isn't it? That's what I guess that's what the young people the, like, love. Less known, lesser known characters, wasn't it? They didn't center around like the Hamburglar or one of the popular folks. Sorry, Ross. Well, I was just saying there's great lore with McDonald's. Like how many fast food places have, you know, this many mascots? They, they, it's like the Marvel Cinematic Universe <laughs> for, for fast food. It, it could have been Grimace. That there's a lot of places they could go with this. Yeah. <laughs> I would not watch that film. Um, it is speaking, though, to this increasing to-go trend. And to-go has always been a big part of um, U.S. culture, whether that's drive through banks, whether that's getting your coffee uh, to, to, to go. drive through banks, I mean, like you can go to the pull up to the ACM in your car and you can pull up to the pharmacy um, in your car. Um, so, But that is being accentuated. And if you go to Potbelly, Sweetgreen, um, Chopped, um, a, a lot of those uh, restaurants are, are now have um, less seating, uh, to go shelves, uh, more self-service kiosks, and so uh, they are also trying to you know, take some share from this um, iced, uh, um, customizable drinks market that Starbucks is benefiting from. But I think it also speaks to this broader trend of um, a lot of stores experimenting with more, you know, sent to go focused um, concepts. Starbucks being one of them, actually. Um, all right, folks, let's move to round two. Let's start with Karina. Global women's sports explodes. Set to exceed $1 billion next year on the heels of growing viewership and advertiser interests, writes our very own senior director of briefings, Jeremy Goldman, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he was citing Deloitte uh, for the numbers. This over $1 billion would be a 300% increase from just three years ago. Uh, Jeremy points out that soccer and basketball are projected to be the most valuable sports, bringing in over $500 million for soccer, over $300 million for basketball. But Karina, what has fueled the rise of women's sports the most in recent years? I think really it's just been a little bit more investment in it. Women's sport has always been really underfunded um, and there's been a bit more investment, which has increased broadcast coverage and that's increased interest and awareness. And, you know, women's sport is just as good as male sport at the end of the day, isn't it? I'm going to argue. Um, so I Better. think then there's been women's it's sport successes and it's not kind of mired by the same, you know, men's sports been a bit mired by doping scandals and all sorts of politics. And women's sport, I think, is still something a bit kind of shiny and newer to a lot of people. Um, and I guess for advertisers, media rights are relatively cheap versus men's sports. So it's an, a, an attractive thing to invest in. So I think it's about time. And I'm glad that it's happened. Yeah. Bill. Um, I think it's entertainment. I think that's the answer. It's, it's a bit of a divisive topic, this one. Um, I think it was Serena Williams that, that happily admitted if she played in the men's game, she probably wouldn't be in the top 100 or whatever. But if you were to watch a men's tennis match or a women's tennis match as a neutral, the women's match is far more entertaining. You get longer rallies. It's just a, a better game. Um, and this translates into other sports as well. And uh, the viewing public's waking up to this. Um, you know, we're seeing over in Europe soccer crowds for live women's soccer matches of 40 50 60 000. um and where you know where eyeballs go advertisers follow so it's a boom time for women's sports i agree with karina it's much better to watch as well and i'm delighted about it mm -hmm. yeah maybe england will actually bring it home if it's they the already, women in they, already have. they already have they already have they won oh, the euros well, that's yeah. very true that's very true yeah won the euros um now got their eyes set on the world cup um it's just a better quality of product, um, at least for England uh, soccer, watching the women versus watching the men at the moment. So, yeah, I think, yeah, the fact that they are performing at such an incredible level as well um, is uh, is part of the, uh, the puzzle here. Ross? Well, sports are propping up television companies that don't have much else going on, and they need to diversify beyond just um, 
you know, American football and, and soccer. So going with promoting women's sports more gives them uh, another place to, to gain audience. And another sport that wasn't called out in um, the art- article you cited is women's college volleyball. There's been a few matches this year that have gotten over a million U.S. homes to tune in, which is a record. And the greatest team of all, of course, is the University of Nebraska Cornhusker volleyball team. They set a women's world record this year in attendance. They had over 92,000 people attend a volleyball match in the football stadium. Um, That's even more fans than attended the... um, famous world cup match that was held at the Rose bowl, like 20 years ago when Brandy Chastain hit that game winning goal. So um, just want to give a shout out to them. Uh, They are the greatest. And (laughs) Ross is a alum of Nebraska in case you didn't get that, but um, wasn't that against the, it was Nebraska against Nebraska state. Was that right? Uh, Nebraska? Yeah. It was Nebraska uh, Lincoln versus Nebraska Omaha. And then they had two state colleges before, you know, it wasn't, um, a high stakes match like against Wisconsin or but something which would drive still, even more well yeah, well yeah potentially those rivalry games definitely draw a lot of audience but well in Wisconsin set um an indoor record this year that they had it um at like this large basketball arena in Wisconsin mm-hmm. there was almost 20,000 people to attend um Iowa basketball Caitlin Clark is a phenomenal player they had a basketball game in the football stadium and it was very cold and yeah. they still had like over 50,000 people watching um women's college basketball games yeah. so uh you know it, it's happening um in other that's, places especially in the american midwest that's also a better product women's basketball ncaa basketball it's yeah it's phenomenal at the moment um a quick thing from me so in terms of like balancing the scales i thought this was a great example from jeremy espn recently featured an all women sorry all female team on sports center um on air and behind the scenes and these special episodes were sponsored by ally bank who's allocating 45% of its sports marketing budget this year to women's sports. That's more than its 40% goal goal that's set in May. And moving forwards, they're going for a 50-50 split with men's sports by 2024. Um, At the halfway mark, Karina just out in front with five. Bill and Ross tied with four apiece. Round three, we start with Bill. The return of the bundle. We used to bundle channels with cable. Streaming came along uh, and fragmented TV. And now we're coming full circle with streaming platforms start to bundle up for the winter. Karina gets it. Or, or maybe the other guys get it, but they're not very impressed. Moving on. Uh, you funny. can already... Uh, what was that, Bill? It wasn't funny, that's why. Okay, funny. okay. <laughs> v, if we can cut that out, please. I just wondered if that's all you had. tumbleweed. <laughs> tumbleweed, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Karina. The best I've got. Uh, you can already pair Disney Plus with uh, Hulu. Uh, there are plans to combine the apps as well. Uh, Netflix and Max will soon offer a $10 and supported bundle via Verizon. Apple and Paramount are reportedly in early talks to offer their services at a discounted price, according to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Showtime will become Paramount Plus with Showtime at the start of 2024. So a lot going on in terms of bundling. Bill, are streaming services, sorry, are streaming bundles inevitable? Yeah, I, I think you kind of said it all. Um, oh, good. You know, Moving it, on. It, Round four. Yeah. <laughs> You wanted us to be brief. Um, (laughs) It's it's funny how things go full circle, but, you know, as you said, it's become a very fragmented fragmented market, um, an expensive market. Uh, We're we're seeing heaps of interest in ad-supported subscription options and free ad-supported streaming options. So, you know, from the consumer side, there's indications that there's a thirst for bundles from a cost-saving perspective. So, yes, this is going to be a thing. Yeah, cost savings is interesting. Big savings for consumers, potentially. I mean, individually... Netflix is seven, Max is 10. Together, they're 10 via Verizon. So it could be pretty significant cost savings for consumers, depending on how you package things. Ross? Well, with the bundles, usually it's the ad-supported plan that is pushed out. So these services don't mind giving that out for nearly free. That, that's something Hulu's done for a long time with partnerships with Spotify or how they bundle mm-hmm. it in with the other Disney streaming services. Um, so a lot of them are just trying to get more... Um, reach they have they have very little advertising reach right now and they're they're willing to operate at a loss for a little while to do that because in the end they'll eventually make it up on the ad revenue through all that viewing karina yeah and i think um on that ad supported tiers it's an interesting thing because one of amazon's strength in the kind of streaming wars is that its prime membership isn't just about prime video it's got lots of other 
perks that you get as a prime member so it can make quite bold moves in uh ad supported such as announcing that there's just going to be advertising on prime video as of next year mm -hmm. and that's something that the other platforms don't really have the luxury of so they've got to find other ways a to add value for the customers and b to um be able to push out those ad supported tiers yep a uh, quick point from daniel konstantinovich who writes for our briefing he was saying that being tied to a phone plan could significantly reduce churn as well. So if you're getting this, uh, was it Max and Netflix, $10 for the ad-supported bundle um, via Amazon deal, uh, maybe people are less likely to cancel it because it is tied to their phone plans. Um, let's move to round four. Double points round four. And Green is still out in front by a point all to play for. Ross It's going to kick off round four for us. Keeping up with AI, Adam Satiriano and Cecilia Kang of... The New York Times explained that countries are losing the race to tackle AI harms as the technology evolves faster than their policies. Uh, they explained that EU leaders at the forefront of tech legislation drafted a law to regulate AI in April 2021. They got input from thousands of experts for three years. It was held as a landmark policy. Um, and also called, uh, it was uh, future proof. Then came ChatGPT uh, that wasn't even in the draft. Uh, however, a year after ChatGPT came out, Europe has passed the world's first comprehensive AI rules, the AI Act. But Ross, uh, what's the key to AI rules keeping up with AI development? Well, we need uh, people of a reasonable age making policy. There's just way too many old people dictating laws in, in around the world, but especially in the U.S. Um, go watch those hearings from a few years ago of 70 and 80 year old lawmakers asking Mark Zuckerberg how Facebook advertising works. So. <laughs> We want to, you know, control this. Um, you know, we, we got to start asking young people for their input on these things. Yeah. Karina. Yeah. I mean, I think we also just need a bit of an overhaul of legislative process because they're just too slow, really, to keep up with these kind of rapidly changing technologies. I read a really interesting argument in the Financial Times that a kind of bottom up union led approach rather than a top down approach could help regulate mm. AI. So the Writers Guild of America which represents the Hollywood writers, part of their deal that they struck included rules around how studios can use AI and projects union, using union writers. I think that's a really good idea. And they made the really good point that workers are in a good place to kind of understand the technology and how it should be curved because they're using it and they're on the ground. Yeah, Bill. Um, yeah, you already spoke about them having to row it back already because things moved on so quickly. I, I would suggest in order to account for things like this, you could make the regulations within these laws, these acts, as as broad ranging as possible, more like guide guidelines, guidance. Uh, I know lawmakers don't like that. They don't like wiggle room, but I think that might be the only way to, to roll with the punches and, and the inevitable changes that will follow in AI. Mm-hmm. Um, some excellent, excellent points, folks. Some really good suggestions here. Um, that's the end of the game. Let's uh, let's count the scores. Uh, we take a drum roll for suspense. And this week's winner is Karina. Is this week's winner of the game of the week? Congratulations to you. Thirteen points for you. Ten and ten for Ross and Bill in a joint second place. You get the championship belt, which hopefully you don't throw back at me directly in the face. Uh, and the last word. Thanks very much. I forgive you now, Marcus. Do you? Mm. It doesn't feel like it. <laughs> That's the only reason you let her win. Yeah. No. It's a mm. truce. I Maybe. won for my great arguments, Bill. Of course, yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, last word, Karina? That was my last word. Oh, that was your I last forgive word. You. Okay, cool. We're yeah. friends again. All right, good. <laughs> yeah. Good last word. Uh, so we've got time for for the game. Let's move to dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing we've learned this week. We start with this week's winner of the game of the week, Karina. So the I've, hates me the least. <laughs> I've Just. got some data from women's sport in England to keep on the theme. Oh, hello. So apparently 39% of women aged 16 and over, presumably in England, are not active enough to get the full health benefits of sport and physical activity compared to 35% of men. And there are 313,600 fewer women than men who are regularly active. And when asked, 13 million women said they'd like to do more sport and physical activity. But 4 in 10 women aren't active enough to make sure they get the full health benefits. Huh. Hmm. They'd like to. I wonder what the barrier is there. 
Is it like access to teams? I think there's loads of it. it's access to teams. It's perhaps, I don't know, embarrassment at doing things. It's hard to start, isn't it? There's lots yeah. of, yeah, there's lots of barriers. And you feel like you have to, sometimes you feel like you can only go to the gym if you look like LeBron James or Cristiano exactly Ronaldo that. as opposed to, oh, yeah. or you can only play the sport if you're excellent at it. And having access to just kind of rec leagues and, and, and things, I think is um, a huge um, leg up in terms of getting started. Yeah, and hopefully this kind of increased interest in women's sport is going to inspire more yeah. girls and women to get into it. And... Well, that's a good point. I don't see a ton of, like there's a ton of like obviously Sunday leagues and men, men's Sunday leagues. I haven't seen driving around England being a bunch of different towns. Like I've never seen like women's rec it to the same scale or remotely to the same scale. Hopefully that starts to increase. Yeah, there's definitely not as much it, of it. Yeah. Mm. It, it's starting in the younger age groups. So oh, girls fantastic. football is really is getting much, much bigger now. Um, okay. So I, I coach my son's team and in the club, we have loads of girls teams in every age group. Mm. Okay. Okay. My dad coaches women's basketball, has done for like 20 odd years as well as some men's basketball too and so that i've always seen it in basketball land but um yeah less so in in football uh very nice though um yeah very sobering statistics let's move to ross so recently shohei atani his greatest baseball player on earth um signed a 700 million dollar contract with the la dodgers and what i want to talk yes. about is how unusual um his contract yes. is because He's only going to get paid two million per year, and the other sixty-eight million per year is deferred. And um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because New York Mets fans are familiar with um, Bobby Bonilla Day. So uh, Bobby Bonilla was a All Star in the '90s, and the Mets cut him in 1999. And rather than pay out his salary, they agreed to pay him like 1.2 million dollars for 25 years, starting in 2011. So um, there's this weird thing where every July, this player who hasn't played for the Mets in a long time and has kind of been forgotten about gets another million dollars. So Shohei Atani, so th this relates to Shohei Atani because Bobby Bonilla's payments from the Mets, who he last played for in 1999, is going to end in 2035. <laughs> and Shohei's, um, the, the bulk of his money is going to start coming to him in 2034. So we're going to have like a new thing, like, you know, 12 years from now where we'll have Shohei Atani Day, who knows if he'll even still be in the league then, who will wow. just get this annual uh, payment for the rest of his life, damn near. And um, we, we just have a peaceful transition, I guess, of deferred payments in baseball because teams realize they don't want to, you know, be penalized for tax reasons and for uh, salary cap purposes. They just kick that count down the road, even if it means giving someone over half a million, half a billion dollars. So you think that's coming, it's coming more from the team being like, this is more team friendly as opposed to Shohei being like, it'd be nice if I didn't get it all at once so I could spend it all at once. Yeah, I think it's more, of, I mean, he'll, he'll get more money in the end and he has a lot of endorsement deals. So I, I don't think he's right. gonna really be in money. trouble <laughs> making just $2 million per year. Living of his, in a uh, one bedroom apartment. Like, yeah, he's not like Brock Purdy, you know? <laughs> <New>. uh, <laughs> yeah. He's making only 900k uh, right. as a <laughs> as Super Bowl MVP, MVP or, or okay. as, as an MVP candidate, but yeah. um, I, I think it's more favorable uh, to the Dodgers right now because they have a really high payroll. So um, mm -hmm. he, they they already had the highest payroll before this, and um, doing this allows them to sign more people right now. If they had to pay him everything like what he's owed, the way a normal contract would be structured. Like they'd have to start cutting some star players, and and that's not, yeah. um, you know, what they want to do. As a Dodgers fan, very excited. Although with the Dodgers, so we'll maybe get half a championship out of this. He's also not very young. He's 29 years old, and so the end of this contract, he's going to be pushing 40. So I, d I wonder if this age is well. I mean, it's baseball. You know, it's not like he's going to run around a soccer pitch. Um, but we'll see. Karina, Bill, you get it, right? Any thoughts on Shohei? Tony. Ah, they agree with me and Ross. Uh, all right, Bill, you're up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I didn't get the memo that this section had to be sports related, so I I've taken a different route. I'm going festive. Um, and I learned this week that there's a store in Cumbran, South Wales, where they're already preparing for Christmas 2025 
Festive Productions is one of the UK's biggest Christmas decoration suppliers, and it keeps trend, uh, track of trends in uh, fashion, homewares, stationery, interiors, all, all, whole manner of things to help inform its coming year's stock. And it's already predicted what people will be buying for Christmas 2024, and that's in stock and on display now. And they're now trying to predict 2025 trends, and that's just far too organized for my liking. <laughs> Wait, what are people buying next year? Oh, go, go to South Wales and you'll find out. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. Swansea, I'll see you soon. Is it Swansea? I don't really know my Welsh. Cumbran. Name. But Swansea's in the south, right? Isn't Swansea in the south it of it Wales? Is. Yeah. Let's pretend it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh. All right. Let's, um... Yeah, I haven't. I really haven't bought anything for this year, so I haven't really given 2024 too much thought. So any of my family who are listening, um, it's probably a gift card, if I'm honest. Or some money. Remember we used to do that? We used to just put like a bit of cash in a card. Where did that go? Why is that not socially acceptable I should, anymore? I, I still do I, it. I still do that, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> I still do it. Okay, folks. Of course you three do. Unbelievable. <laughs> you just circulate the same £10 note or $10 bill around to your friends every time. I'll put it in the card. Here you go. It's your turn. Um, all right. Very nice, Bill. Uh, so, all right. I've got one for you real quick. Will we live underwater soon? Maybe. So, Catherine Latham of the BBC writes that on November 3rd, 2026... A crew of six fully trained aquanauts. I think I found my new gig once this podcast thing goes up in flames. Um, aquanauts uh, will be, these aquanauts will be, develop, uh, will be deployed uh, in a new oceanic habitat system, uh, beginning what promises to be the era of humanity's continuous presence underwater, Miss Latham notes. How do aquanauts feel about aquabats? What's an aquabat? It's a ska band that had like a little kids show. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the, go <laughs> uh, the goal here is to create a kind of international space station for oceans. Um, so research org uh, organization Deep is building a subsea habitat called the Sentinel that lets people live at depths of up to 200 meters, that's nearly 700 feet, uh, for up to a month at a time, uh, revolutionizing the way scientists observe, monitor, and understand the oceans. Uh, the underwater facility will feature submarines, livable residences, research labs and observatories uh, on the seabed and will open its doors to the public this is for the aquanauts but will open its doors to the public by 2027 it sounds like i'm making this up but i'm not that's I mean, terrifying the, pla the planet's going yeah that, i mean we're all going to be underwater but yeah we don't really anyway, have much of a we? choice this is just going to yeah. be a thing we're preparing for when the planet when we're basically we're living in water world great film so i, I was thinking more right. um sandy from spongebob squarepants oh oh yeah She's got like her little dome. She's yeah. Got the, <laughs> yeah. It's got a good the too. Fishbowl yep. helmet. So, Karina will build too, but you live next to the ocean. Would you go one step further? Live in it? I love diving. So, I would think oh, about maybe. it. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. yeah, maybe. A permanent. I'd like dive. to be an aquanaut. An aqua. Pretty cool, isn't it? So, there's actually yeah. there's a group of folks. This is amazing. According to one scientific journal, there's an indigenous. Uh, the, uh, there's uh, a group of indigenous folks called the Baju, I think I'm saying that wrong, people. Um, it translates to sea, noba sea nomads of Indonesia. They've developed genetic, uh, genetically, uh, gen genetically enlarged spleens, which enable them to free dive to depths of up to 70 meters. Wow. Or 230 feet for as long as 13 minutes at a time. So they're well ahead. Mad. They'll be ready for this. They'll be right. Yeah. Um, the idea of humans living underwater, yeah, it's not a new concept. In the 60s, French ocean explorer, who I mentioned before on the show, like maybe last year, Jacques-Yves Cousteau, uh, built an underwater village. Um, other projects followed. Um, none have had a continuous human presence under the ocean. But things are pretty bleak. So we, we're preparing for 2030. It's when really we'll cheery be... ending. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's quite fitting with how... My guests have behaved throughout. That's all we've got time for for this episode. Thank goodness. Uh, thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Bill. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Thank you to Ross. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to this week's winner of the game of the week, Karina. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. James, who copy edits it. Stuart, who runs the team. Uh, Sophie, who does our social media. Lance, who runs our video when we're doing video podcast stuff. Thanks to everyone for listening in. Um, 
We'll see you hopefully on Monday for the Behind the Numbers Daily Z Marketer podcast made possible by Affinity Solutions. Happiest of weekends. <laughs> Thank you.